a, it's a huge, uh, huge pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Michael Bro to you. Uh, I met Michael in 2011, I think, uh, which was right after he did, he'd released uh, Glitch Tank, which is a two-player roguelike game, you could think of it that way. And I think that was actually a period of time that marked a, a turning point for Michael. He'd been involved in this really uh, long-term, detailed, slightly tortured uh, development process, very much like a Jonathan Blow game. Uh, and he got his game out, and uh, I think he'd felt a little bit disillusioned with that. So he decided to completely change tack and embarked on this process of really rapid-fire development. He, uh, he made like a, a very large series of games in the ensuing two years, uh, some two-player games, some action games, uh, and uh, I think he made the, uh, the world's best hungry hippo-like. Uh, but Michael is best known uh, for a uh, series of, of, of roguelikes, each getting more and more interesting and developing more and more interesting themes. And I think uh, over that period of time, uh, by a lot of people's estimation, not just mine, Michael has become uh, one of the most exciting and dynamic uh, developers in the world, owing much to this change in philosophy and this change in approach. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm really super excited to see Michael's talk about roguelikes. So I uh, hope you'll join me in giving him a hand. Uh, hi. Um, am I on? Can you hear me? Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, this is the first roguelike I ever played when I was a child, Castle of the Winds. And I got quite obsessed with it. Um, some of the first attempts at game design I did were making up, just filling up notebooks with lists of enemies and equipment. To, I, I, don't, I don't know how to technically program them into a game, but I you know, made them up and imagined that if they were mixed together in the same way they were mixed together in this game, then I'd have my own game. Um, yeah, so <laughs> to, to some extent, that's still now how I use genres. They're, they're, they're a base that I can make up my own bits and mix them into. Um, yeah, so, what should we this is rogue. Um, so, yes, I'm just using a series of images as slides. Sorry, I'm a bit disorganized. <laughs> um, so, roguelikes are games that are literally like rogue. <laughs> <laughs> what what exactly that means is a topic for internet arguments. So, I don't want to get into it too precisely. Um, but these are these are some properties that they usually have. Uh, randomization. Particularly the level generation is randomized, but also many other parts of the game, item descriptions, monsters, where they appear, what they do. Um, and this, okay, I, I feel a bit awkward talking about replayability because every game is replayable in the sense that every book is rereadable. But th these have a certain kind of replayability in that the content of the game itself changes. And it's, in a way, it's like playing a new game each time. And that, that's kind of magical. Um, permadeath, you know what that means. There was a lot of talk about that yesterday in the problem session. Basically, your ability to save the game is limited, so you can't. It, it ties in with randomness. Like if there's something random and you uncover what it is, if you can then go back to a save game and randomize it again, it's less random. If you can keep trying until you get the outcome you want, it's not random at all. Um, and they're usually on a grid, turn-based. If you remove this last property, you get what people often call a roguelike-like. So something like Spelunky, where it has the first two properties, but it's a platformer. Um, but this isn't meant to be a definition. These are just some, some things they do. Um, so K Keith in his talk talked a bit about some of the problems of roguelikes. So I might try to wing it a bit and respond to what he said and not not re not repeat what he said. Um, so 
He mentioned the that one one game dungeon crawl has an auto explore function because there there are parts of parts of the game that c c essentially you're not making any decisions while you're doing them, so they can be automated. Um, that's not <laughs> so some roguelike players express that there's there's some value to be gotten out of doing those areas where there aren't interesting decisions because it takes discipline, it takes concentration, you have to... Essentially what happens is there's nothing to be gained but you can lose something. Like if you're running down a corridor, a dragon jumps out at you. If you're just holding down the key not paying attention, probably the dragon gets a few hits in before you respond. Or if you're taking it carefully one step at a time meditatively, then then, then you don't have that risk. Um, so, uh, that doesn't really appeal to me, but some people get something out of it. So I, I don't want to dismiss it as having no value, but <laughs> yeah. So part of where that comes from, the, the, the map in Rogue is 80 by 20 tiles wide, and other roguelikes have similar sizes. Um, this is my game, Zaga 33, it's 9 by 9. So I've, I've tried to address this problem by just going to a significantly smaller size. There's not so much open space, so you're not having to spend a lot of turns running down a corridor, not, not, not making choices. Um, so, uh, Rogue's 80 by 20. Com for comparison, Go is 19 by 19. Chess is 8 by 8. You, you shouldn't ever need more more, a bigger possibility space than Go, really. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically, if you have a large map, I, I think this applies to any type of game, try compressing it down into less space, and probably the game will get better, because there's less open space, as objects in the game are interacting more often. This is basically magic. Um, okay, so we're... We're fighting on a grid. What what shape the grid has makes a difference. So this is a roguelike, I can't remember what it's called, it's, but it's on a hexagonal grid. Um, so hexagonal grid compared to a square grid, it's harder to get surrounded because there are six spaces around rather than four. Although so sometimes the square grid, I'll, I'll get into diagonal movement in a bit, but sometimes they have diagonal movement, which means you have eight spaces around you, so then that makes it even harder to get surrounded. But on the other hand, the more spaces you can get surrounded in. When you do get surrounded, it's worse. So the, the, the precise tactics change depending on the grid. This is, this is Hyper Rogue. It's on some weird hyperbolic geometry. So some, of these, some of these are hexagons, some of them are heptagons. So they, they, they have different tactical value. So I think that's, that's quite interesting. Uh, this is not a roguelike at all, but <laughs> rather than grids, we could just have whatever arrangement of tiles we like. So the, the ones in the corners have two next to them, so they they have a different value to the ones in the center, which have six next to them. So th there's there's interesting stuff to do with varying the grid type, but usually most games seem to use a square grid, I think just because it's easier to program. And that's that's not a bad reason to do anything. <laughs> that helps you. <laughs> that helps you get things done, uh, and that's that's great. So, thinking a bit about what what the square grid is like, I, th I think the most important thing about it is that it's bipartite, which is a mathematical term, which just means you can color it in two colors, like the chessboard, black and white, such that each tile all the ones next to it are of a different colour from it. And this, this has implications for movement. So think of chess, the bishop moves diagonally, that means it always stays on the same colour. The, 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 the knight moves in an L shape, that means it always changes colour. And in roguelikes, usually the piece can just move one space. So in some they can move diagonally, which means they can choose whether they want to stay on black or move to white. But in mine, I've stuck with not moving diagonally, which has an interesting side effect. Um, so if there's an opponent that's on a black square and you're on a black square, you both take a step, now you're both on white squares, 
you're both on black squares, you never end up next to each other. And that's, that's kind of weird. Um, unless you deliberately move next to them and then they can, they can take a hit on you. Or, but why would you ever want to do that? Um, so uh, maybe you want to do that because you're in a situation like this and you have no other way out. Um, players really don't like, in general, this being forced to move into attack. So a lot of roguelikes have a, a wait command, which in this situation, you sit still, skip a turn, staying on the same colored tile when the troll moves in to attack you. But that's not entirely satisfactory to me, because why would the troll move in to take a hit from you? It could <laughs> sit still and you'd just be in a stalemate. So I've, in my games, sort of omitted having a wait command so that you're forced to move. And so it, there's a term in chess called, I might pronounce this wrong, I should have asked my wife who speaks German first, Zugzwang, which means compulsion to move. Um, it is used to describe situations where you hurt your position with any move you make. And players get really uncomfortable about this, I found. They, they want to only be improving their position. But as a game designer, I think it's kind of cool to give a, a terrible choice between bad alternatives. But yeah, so y you could say this is a problem that that if you if you don't have a wait command, then you're forced to move into bad situations. Most roguelikes solve this by adding a wait command. But that that that's kind of an assumption, like Rob was talking about. L list your assumptions. Why, why do you need to have a wait command? Are there other ways you could solve the same problem? Um, so, as I said, Zaga 33 ignores it. Diagonal movement kind of partially solves it, because it lets you, if you want to be in the same place, while the enemies change color, maybe if you move in a little triangle, you've spent three turns staying in the same place. That's, <coughs> that's different. Um, diagonal movement's kind of weird in general, because the number of steps across the room diagonally. In geometry, that's square root of two times the side length, but in a turn-based game, that's the same number of steps. So in diagonal movement geometry, this room is a circle, because it's the same number of steps from the center of the room to any edge point. Um, micro uh, lets you take one or two steps in the same direction. Th there are different ways of solving this. Um, uh, got a slide of ending somewhere here. I think I put it at the end. Yeah. Aaron Steed's game ending does something interesting with this. You, because in roguelike, in chess when you attack a piece you move on to it, capture it. In roguelikes attacking is staying still for a turn. So it's kind of waiting, but it's waiting uh, while attacking. In, in ending, enemies take one hit to kill. So, you can attack it, you've stayed in place, you've used up that enemy as a resource to let you wait for a turn. And that that's quite an interesting way of dealing with this. Like You have to figure out what order to attack them and to keep switching, switching which color you're on with, with respect to the other enemies. Um, what was I? Um, my game 868 hack does this as well, but it lets you have a ranged attack. So you can you can wait if you're in the column with an enemy, even if you're not right next to them, and that that works. I, I also put a command wait, which is an ability that you can pick up that you spend resources on. And so this this is a this is a general concept. If something's advantageous, why not attach a resource cost to it rather than you know giving it out for free? Um, at some point, so I'd th these games have permadeath, so you can't save the game. At some point in development, I had an ability called save, which let you <laughs> spend resources to save the game. That that didn't last, but it it made it in some form as undo, which lets you just go back to the previous turn, and that's that lets you you know reveal hidden information and then take it back, still knowing the information, randomize something, and then go back and re-randomize it, but because you're paying a cost to do this, it's something, it's, it's an interesting choice whether to go ahead with it or, 
or try again. Um, okay, what else happens in tech? Yeah, it's different sessions. Oh, this GIF isn't animating. Yeah, so there's so w waiting is an example of doing something kind of boring, standing in place to get an advantage. Th this is a s situation that happens all the time in roguelike tactics. Um, you can move back and forth to get an advantage. This is, this is called pillar dancing. It's a tactic that comes up in a lot of them where as long as you keep going around in a circle, the, the monster can never catch up with you. If the obstacle wasn't there, then it would just move into the center and you'd have to keep running away in the same direction. Eventually, you'd run out of space. Uh, this is especially bad because a lot of these games, your hit points regenerate over time. So by, by delaying, you're actively gaining an advantage. Um, so, so some of these games try to... Uh, uh, the, this situation comes up in my game, Zaga 33, as well, even though it doesn't have regeneration. So that this enemy here moves randomly. If you move back and forth, it'll eventually just randomly get out of your way. So by itself, you can just bide your time and bypass it rather than have to engage with it. Um, Spelunky has a ghost giving a time limit for each level. Um, so uh, Rogue solves this by having monsters appear over time, which if you're biding time, then they threaten you. But also it has experience points, so monsters are a resource. So if you're biding your time, the you're actually gaining an advantage if you survive killing the monster. So it also has a, a food timer. You, you get hungry and starve to death. Um, yeah, so experience points. Maybe I'll random ramble on a bit about experience points because I think they're kind of problematic um, and my games have deliberately omitted them. Basically, if a game has experience points, that's pushing you to kill as many enemies as you can. And usually it's balanced so that you're expected to kill some number of enemies. Uh, the, the tactics this encourages are clearing out enemies that you had no reason to kill. It's kind of sociopathic. <laughs> you're exploring a corner of the enemies. That, uh, you know, it, it makes you the kind of person who'll shoot a dog just because the dog wasn't even in your way, it wasn't attacking you. <laughs> it's just, it just makes you feel like a better, stronger person to kill it. That's weird. Um, yeah, so what I found wh when, when I started making Zyga 33, I assumed it would have experience points, but what I found when I left them out is that it actually created a choice where previously there hadn't been one. Do I want to engage these enemies or can I sneak around it? Um, so that's, yeah, don't use experience points. If, or, or try not using them. So some games, Dota uses them to interesting aesthetic effect. But yeah, uh, okay. What am I gonna talk about? 868 hack. Okay, so. Uh, the the inspiration for this what okay Zaga thirty three I the okay Rogue has a bunch of different types of items single use items equipment swords and shields uh, ones that are multiple use items but a limited number of charges in Zaga thirty three I just used single use items because those have those have an interesting decision in them and that you can use them now, or you can save them for later. Right now you know exactly what advantage you get from using them, you don't know what the advantage will be later. So that's interesting. Um, so that was kind of easy to work with, because that's interesting in Rogue. Equipment choices in Rogue aren't interesting. You take the thing with the biggest numbers on it. And I wanted to try and make a choice that's exclusive, like getting equipment, because you, you can't be wielding a sword or an axe, you have to pick one, but was more interesting than that. So... When you say the biggest number, you mean a plus few, a plus one. Exactly, yeah. Or th there's you know, a long sword is better than a club, um, so it has a, a hidden number attached, but once you know what that number is, it, it's just picking the, yeah. So... Yeah, this, this gets onto the topic of how to even make a choice interesting, which is a big topic in game design. 
so I won't try to completely solve it. <laughs> but there are a few things I want to say about it. So picking the biggest number isn't interesting, but a lot of choices in a strategy game come down to picking the biggest number. Uh, that number isn't necessarily plus two, plus three sword, but it's how, mu how many points does this give me or how does this increase my chances of winning? Uh, even when there's random elements, we can work out the probabilities probabilities and numbers pick the biggest one and um, that kind of applies to any choice in a strategy game so at some level I don't really understand how a strategy game can work because anything you do in it reduces to pick the biggest number but at some level they do work because we can't we, we, we make these numbers hard to figure out um, but yeah, there's a lot of talk about interesting choices in strategy games, but so what here's an example of an interesting choice. Do I quit my PhD to make games? Like <laughs> 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 That's an interesting choice because that's that's choosing who I want to be. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, like do I want to stay at home and read a book or go out with my friends? Th th these are interesting choices because you're choosing what your motivations are. In in a strategy game, your motivation is set, it's I want to win the game. So we, we talk about interesting choices, but we don't have anything on the interesting choices that happen in real life. Um, but so, so basically I think what we do is try to make the choices so annoying to figure out what the numbers are that no one bothers to do it. Yeah, so chess, we've, we've been trying to solve chess for years and no one's done it because it would take quite a long time running on a lot of computers. So that's too annoying to figure out. So you know, we, we, we treat it as ambiguous because we don't know the answer. And I think when, when a choice is, w when we don't know the answer, how we make a choice comes down to, we, we use the same mechanism for making we use for making real life choices and that's that's part of what makes games as particularly strategy games interesting that we're engaging that mechanism um, and what what that mechanism is do I want to listen to hip-hop or jazz is partially it's about choosing your identity um, in a strategy game do I want to be the guy with the army of horsemen or the army of archers that's if you don't know the right choice numerically that's a that's a role-playing choice so choices in strategy games are kind of role-playing. They're, they're, they're choosing an identity. Um, that was a bit of a tangent, but, <laughs> but perhaps appropriate. Uh, <laughs> so I, yeah, I was thinking about how to, how to make the choices awkward enough that you don't know what the right answer is. And Basically, the the method I have is making there be several different reasons that you would pick one over the other, so you don't know which reason is most important. Um, so here's a list of resources uh, of abilities in eight six eight hack, and so among these there there are some powerful combos. This might be a slight spoiler. Uh, oh well, you should have played the game already. So th the ability push. Uh, it moves enemies away from you. The ability debug, it, it destroys any enemies that are on top of a wall. So the push ability, it moves them away from you even if there's a wall there. And then, so th there's a combo. You can put them onto a wall and then destroy them because they're on a wall. So if, if you have one of those abilities, suddenly everyone's more, valu more valuable because you know there's a combo. Um, other, other reasons to make choices? Th th there are different resource costs. I put two different kinds of resource, credits and energy, so that there's some depth in choosing between them. So if you have, if everything you've picked up so far costs credits, you're probably accumulating energy that you have no way to use. You want some way to expend that. So y you'll value something that costs energy over something that costs credits again. Um, there are, some of these come in like categories. There are offensive ones, defensive ones. If you have one defensive one, then you don't so much want another defensive one. They drop in value. 
even though they might be more efficient in a particular situation, the, the one you already have will do as well most of the time. Also, a way to make these choices difficult is to keep some of the rules secret, which is something you can't do in a board game, but videos are great at. So when you start playing, you don't quite, I've put these kind of vague descriptions that hint at what they do, but they don't explicitly make clear everything. So you, 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 you choose based on what you think it might do, rather than complete knowledge. Uh, and that's cool, that's cool, I think. Some people don't like that, but that's, that's a matter of taste, really. Uh, yeah, risk, yes, I had a list of these. Uh, so some the, the more powerful ones are also more risky to get because there's a mechanic where when you pick something up, it spawns a bunch of enemies based on how powerful it is. So if you're, if you're feeling secure, if you've got good things already, you'll take a more powerful thing, otherwise you'll take something that's safer to get. So basically, a bunch of different reasons that are hard to evaluate, just to make there be lots of variables. So if you're trying to work out an equation for what's the right choice, it's just too messy to do and you don't bother. And you just go on feelings and intuition. Okay. Endings, yes. So, Zaga 33 was, I, I originally did it for the seven day roguelite challenge and it was endless. It kept getting harder and harder and harder until you die. Um, so that's the question, what does it mean for a game to get harder? In an, in an action game it gets faster, that it's not trivial to balance, you, you have to get good at the game to, to feel what's the right speed for it to be, but to some extent it's safe to just make it faster and you know it'll be harder. But with a with a turn-based game, it's about making it making the decisions harder, which as I say is kind of awkward. You have you're giving enough time to work it out, but you want it to be awkward <laughs> enough that people don't work it out in full detail. It's it's weird, but I think basically what it comes down to is the game gives you a certain number of resources. You need to expend a certain number of resources. Harder means you have to be more efficient with them. The, the gap between what you need to survive and what you're given diminishes. And what happened in Zaga, the, the resources you needed kept going up and the resources you were given stayed constant until it was impossible. And that that's kind of unsatisfactory. No matter how smart you are, no matter how much you think about it, you, you, you could run supercomputers for a thousand years examining a situation, there's no solution. So it's no use. Um, the alternative though is if you always give out enough resources, then in principle you could play forever. So Either of those is kind of feels bad to me, so I I just solved it by putting an ending on the game, which is nice. Like, you know, the game's going to end either because it became impossible, or because the player could keep going forever and they got bored and quit. That's not a good outcome, or or because they reached a, an ending that you'd put in place. The 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 ending of the game is like the the thing the player takes away from it, so it. It's kind of too important to just leave to leave to chance. It's, I think it's worth designing it in. So, so yeah, I made an ending, and that made the game better. It so the Zaga had a score. Um, so once you got to the ending, you could replay it to get a high score. But it wasn't that interesting. It didn't have much replay value because the score ended up being mostly random. If you get good items, you can save more of them. That's the, you had to play to the randomness, like if you wanted to get a high score you would take higher risks, but it got pretty boring pretty quickly. But th I had one player, a uh, keeper of Rocket Cat games, he made a punch quest and 
uh, yeah, no, no, I can't remember. Uh, Mage Gauntlet, I uh, might might not have heard of it. Um, anyway, he he got really into Zaga Thirty Three, and he wanted to keep playing after the point where just trying for a high score wasn't interesting. So what he started doing was trying to get a streak where he would get to the end of the game as many times as he could in a row without dying. And that turned out to be more interesting than trying for the high score that I'd put in. So I added a counter for it to the game to you know, support it for him and anyone else who wanted to try. And it was quite interesting because to play to get a high score, you had to take high risks. To play to get a streak, you had to play it safe. So there was a kind of symmetry between the, the two kinds of scores. Um, and I mean, getting back to what what makes an interesting choice, what you you could kind of choose what goal you're aiming for, whether you're trying to be the the person who gets a high score or the person who gets a long streak. That's a ch almost a choice of identity, and you choose in the game based on your goal. So I, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, when I when I made eight six eight hack, I had a richer scoring system that took a lot longer to get boring, but it's still after some point is dominated by luck. If you get a good ability early on, you get a higher score than if you don't. You have to play to the luck again, but yeah, it kind of loses its interest after. After a while, so I, you know, I, I already knew a solution to that. Just go for streaks, but I tried to make the streak formula more interesting by, g okay, because how eight six eight hack works is quite easy to get to the end if you don't want any points. The challenge is in figuring out how many points you can safely get while still getting to the end. I say easy if you've played it and not managed to get to the end. Don't worry. <laughs> I mean, yeah, relatively easy. That's still that's still an interesting challenge. Um, yeah, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> it's hard to get to the end, but if you understand the rules well, you can do it quite reliably. So just going for streaks b alone is not, not interesting. But going for streaks while still getting points is. So I took the cumulative score you get without dying, and that's a bit interesting. It, it still had some problems because, okay, getting zero points you can do reliably. Getting one point is not harder than that. So the easiest way to get a thousand points, if you can be bothered playing like that, would be to get one point each game for a thousand games. And that, yeah, it would be hard to achieve that any other way. So. So I went back to the the old way of making it get harder and harder as you go, but in the context of a streak. Um, so if, if you're a few games in, the game starts throwing extra difficulty modifiers at you that make the game harder, and it gets harder and harder and harder until you die, which, as I said before, is kind of unsatisfactory. So that's, yeah, that's a decision I'm not completely sure about, really. I don't know if I should have made the streaks cap at some point. Like, yeah, if you won 100 games in a row, you won. You've solved the game. That's that's enough. Uh, but I didn't. So, yeah, that's. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. But okay, so how does so why are streaks good? I guess is is a question I should answer. Okay, so your score in a single game is maybe you have one percent chance of getting eighty points. That I've just pulled these numbers out of my head; they're not not real numbers, but it, so it's, it'll be something like that. You have a one percent chance of getting eighty points. So, if you play enough times, you'll get a game where that's possible. Um, but to get a streak of eighty point games, that's it. A one percent chance times a one percent chance times a one percent chance that gets very very small very quickly. So basically, you can't count on luck to to help you out. You'll you'll get lucky games in the streak, and 
you'll want to take advantage of them if you can, but it just averages out over time, so it's, it's fine. Um, so some people feel like you, should s you shouldn't bother starting a streak unless the first game is good, but if you take that further, why would you bother starting a streak unless the first two games are good, or the first three? You know, the, the limitation on this is that we don't have enough time to keep rolling the dice until the, the, the outcome we want comes up, so we have to we have to at some point commit to just s sticking with what happens. Uh. Yeah, okay, you, you, don't need, you don't need to use streaks specifically to get the same averaging effect. Averaging works, drop seven just keeps your average score over every game you play. I don't, I don't really like that because it, it includes the games where you're just trying out new ideas and learning the game, so... Hmm? I like it. Well, I'll you, you could you could have like a rolling average over the last ten games. I know, that's yeah, that, that that's that's better. Because otherwise, uh, otherwise, if you have a, a a really bad run, then you have to play it, just grind a lot to to cancel it out. That's and then yeah, and then then, then, <laughs> then then once you've played a lot of games, each new one isn't contributing much to the average. And that's yeah, um, but yeah, um, I think a lot of games could benefit from stealing this kind of system or the averaging system or something like that. To g uh, it makes for interesting scores, score systems. Um, I think that's pretty much all I had to say. How's time? Yeah, should we have time for questions? Is that good, or should I ramble on a bit more? <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really like them because, yeah, basically, the, I guess the game has a limit after what, like, so, some people can beat it pretty reliably, and then they're adding their own challenges to make the game more interesting. And that's, yeah, that's great. Um, I guess it makes less sense. Uh, so, it, uh, I guess I have some kind of approximation of that. Like in 868, there are question mark blocks that you have to pick up to find out what they are. So, there is some hidden information on the level. But, yeah, yeah, that too. Th there's, yeah, I, I can't remember, honestly, why I made that decision in the first place. But, I, I think it feels different when it's just a small space shown on one screen. I should say, show, showing things on one screen is a great reason to use a small map size. I hate having to scroll around to see everything. It's just annoying. Yeah, um, yeah, I think so. I, I'm not good. I'm not good enough at Spelunky to have really gotten into enjoying that competitively. But I think it's a neat idea. Um, so yeah, um, I, I think. Okay, th this is a bit of a tangent. I, I think it's cool, but I think there's something more that could be done with it than what Spelunky does, because. If you watch, so in Spelunky, if you watch a recording someone did early in the day, you have some idea of what's coming because you're on the same seed. That, I don't feel like that helps you that much in that game. It does a bit, knowing what's coming, but I think it'd be really cool if someone made a game where, you know, there's a different seed every day, and it really helps a lot to know what's coming. So people would, you know, maybe be secretive about 
what they saw or maybe share it. You go, you know, you could tweet, oh, there's a giant spider on level three, and that makes everyone who sees that tweet change their tactics accordingly. That would be, that would be interesting. Playing it a lot, yeah, that's all. <laughs> no, I just play it all, all the time and get just you just get a feel for it, whether it's right or not. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Leon Arnott helped a lot, but more like finding exploits and pointing out where the yeah, corners uh, interactions that could have something interesting that I hadn't thought of. Um, the actual tuning of the balancing was mostly just me playing a lot. That's hard to outsource, really. Uh, that, yeah. I want to know if you have a system for how you choose the resource class of the different uh, spells, or if it was just sort of like you played it and tested and saw what worked and like did you have a system for how you choose the Yeah, I, so th that's a really good question, and I could talk for half an hour more about the process of figuring out the resource costs. Yeah, I was. I won't do that. Don't worry. But I'll. I'll try to. See how, how. So. Yeah, I, I tried to give each of the resources a kind of different character. One of them is more focused on attacks. The other one is more um, evasion and manipulation. So that was kind of a, a starting point. And w w then with the abilities that have two resources and their cost, they're kind of, not, not in all cases, but in some cases they kind of reflect one of them's more like delay versus reduce. Reduce is actively eliminating enemies. Delay is making them bide their time so you can deal with them. Uh, yeah, I... So th there's, there's one ability that lets you convert one resource into the other, and that only goes in one direction. And that was a right at the start a deliberate choice to introduce an asymmetry between them. This one is more reliable because you can convert the other one into it. This one's more volatile. And then from that, the, the energy resource it, it became associated with things that you might want to use many times in a row because it's the one that you reliably have access to more of. So push debug. Sometimes you need to push several times, then debug once. Are you understanding this as, as being sort of a narrative choice, or, or is this just how you're trying to create interesting? Uh, I don't think narrative is quite the word I'd use, but something like that. Yeah, the 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 feeling. Of it. Actually, so sometimes uh, the the opposite is even true. Like in in net hacks, some of the character classes are challenge classes that are harder to play. So th in no way are they equally viable. They're 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 kind of difficulty levels. So yeah, to to, to some extent, to some extent, like if it's multiplayer, you want the choices to be a bit balanced, but. Also, the, the expressivity of that choice can be, how hard do I want this game to be? Do I want to challenge myself? Um, 
if if someone is doing that, then that's something bad that your game is enabling. So, <laughs> um, it would. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that very much comes out of doing everything myself. Like, you know, if you have a designer who writes a design document and then someone else goes away and programs it, there's no room for noise to enter the process. Whereas if you're... Did I say something bad? <laughs> I don't know about that. There, there, okay, there's, 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 there's less room. There's less room. But, you know, it, but if, you're, if you are embodying both in one person, if a bug happens, as a, as in your designer mindset, you think, wait, do I need to fix that bug? Whereas if the programmer and the designer are separate, probably the programmer has fixed it before the designer even hears about it. Sorry, I didn't mean to attack your entire way of working. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yes. The answer is yes. I guess I, I don't have a firm answer to that. I'm interested ex in exploring the range of possible mindsets that games can come up with. And the sociopathic hunt down every monster in the dungeon and kill it even if you don't have to is something that we've played out. I, so I, I, don't, I don't think it's at all a bad thing for games to explore. It's a safe space to study that mindset. But I think we've seen it and I'm interested in what else we can do. <laughs> Yeah. It's as if it's a representation of yeah. A sociopath, yeah. Not that the player is no. doing something sociopathic or leading them to sociopathic. No, I, I have no ethical problem with killing things in a game because they're, they're symbols. But. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not to say that it can't be weird that so many games are about killing things. That, that is odd. But. <laughs> Um, usually it's, it's fairly fixed. And in 868 hack, because the enemies stay to the next level, there's actually, I don't think you can use this to your advantage, but it makes sure there are no walls where enemies are, which in principle you could maybe influence and exploit, but I don't think productively you can. But no, I, I, they're, they're just fixed things that you encounter and have to deal with. Well, he has three hit points, and it's a convenient way of representing that. Basically, uh, it, wa it wasn't—it wasn't a conscious decision. It was just, "Hey, full-formed idea. This will be a neat way to represent that." Um, free, why free? Um, because it's a smiley face. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I constantly get people saying, I thought your games were horrible until this one, but there's a different one each time.
Yeah, sometimes. I, I, a lot of these graphics are drawn with my own slightly weird art tool, which is basically unusable, but gets the effects that I want. Um, I have done purely procedural graphics in the past, and that's fun. And a lot of procedural audio because I can't write music. Yeah, that's that's fun. And I think it does help to tie everything together that the graphics and music and game design are not only by the same person, but yeah, glitchy. All right, let's give Michael a big hand.